policies to give public high school graduates and often Afro-Brazilian high school graduates preferences in university admissions. And so this policy began in the early 2000s, continues to the current day. But what has made it so dramatic has been that uh, these affirmative action policies in Brazil have been what we call hard affirmative action policies, basically quotas. Mm. And when you say affirmative action in Brazil, you're basically talking about quotas, socioeconomic quotas, and racial quotas. And in 2012, the Brazilian Supreme Court ruled unanimously that these socioeconomic quotas and these racial quotas are constitutional. They're legal. So again, this is all unprecedented in Brazilian history. It's a big deal. It is likely, if continued, and so far we have a history of 10 to 12 years, if continued, it really will integrate the undergraduate uh, population in Brazil, at least at this uh, most prestigious, uh, these two most, pre most prestigious types of universities state universities and federal universities. And so just to uh, give you an example of how um, this affirmative action policy has advanced, uh, two years, three years ago, the federal government passed a law which required all federal universities to admit 50% of their incoming class had to be public high school graduates, which is to say 50% of the incoming class had to be, had to do all of their high school in a public high school. Why is this important? Because public high schools in Brazil, public school K through 12, tends to be the poorest type of high school in Brazil, the least resourced, um, the most marginalized and disrespected. And so by requiring the most prestigious universities to let 50% of their admissions go to the least prestigious high schools, it was a way of increasing the socioeconomic diversity of the incoming class because most in Brazil most of the uh, public high school students come from poor families working class or poor families families that can't afford to send their kids to private school K through 12 and so uh, that is a big deal and has been seen as a big deal but Black activists have said that historically uh, socioeconomic measures or general social measures, even though even when they've been directed to help the poor, haven't really helped us adequately. So they demanded, and the government agreed, that within this 50% socioeconomic quota, See, public high school status is kind of a, a marker for socioeconomic status. 50% of that quota would have to resemble the racial, color, ethnic breakdown of the individual state. Okay? So if a state was 50% Afro-Brazilian, 50% uh, of the public high school quota students would also have to be Afro-Brazilian. And so, uh, this policy and the other affirmative action policies 
initially met a lot of resistance. All the anti-affirmative action arguments that we had debated here in the United States were invoked in Brazil. That it would be a uh, threat to merit. That it would uh, be unfair to the students. That allow them to come to the top schools, they wouldn't be prepared, they would fail, that would be a tremendous blow to their self-esteem. Every uh, argument imagined, it was reverse racism, it was imported from the United States, every <laughs> critique of affirmative action uh, imaginable was invoked, debated, and rejected by the Congress, the President, and the Supreme Court. So this is kind of a slam dunk victory even though I believe that some of the critics of affirmative action remain critics but they kind of saw the writing on the wall they kind of understood the political dynamics at play and decided to go along with the flow but I think they they really don't fully agree with these affirmative action quota policies that uh, threaten to change the traditional elite university in Brazil. Uh, so this is a super big deal and um, it's currently being implemented as we speak. Uh, like I said, for federal university laws were passed so that um, all federal universities have to implement this policy within four years. So I think the fourth year will be a year or two from now, 50% of their incoming class really has to be uh, public high school graduates. And uh, so far, affirmative action policies in Brazil have been successful. They've been working. Uh, preliminary studies suggest that students admitted through affirmative action whether through the public high school quota or the racial subquota within the public high school quota, appear to be doing as well as students who are admitted through the traditional uh, admissions procedure. And in Brazil, the traditional admissions procedure is different. It's not the same as in the United States. Brazil, uh, uni Brazilian universities have tended to have a high st one high stakes university exam that students took to get it get to college. It didn't matter where you went to high school, what your grades were, what your letters of recommendation. It mattered what you scored on that exam and therefore how high you were ranked. So they still use that procedure. It used to be called the uh, the entrance exam used to be called the uh, vestibula. Uh, and each university made up its own <laughs> entrance exam. Uh, but now there is uh, a new exam called the ENAIM that the federal government, the Department of Education, the Ministry of Education uh, has developed and gives every year. So how you score in that ENAIM determines where you rank in terms of university admissions. And so the, the affirmative action students they still have to take this exam. They still have to do well on this exam to meet the university's minimum entrance requirements. If no or if not enough students uh, meet the minimum requirements to uh, enter the university, they go to the general uh, applicant pool. But so far that hasn't been a problem. Uh, and so I am optimistic in my colleagues and co-authors are as well, that this new affirmative action reality in Brazil may have far-reaching consequences for the country because uh, if you have, if you integrate higher education and the students are doing well, pretty much as well as students admitted through traditional methods, those students are going to graduate. And what do graduates want? They want jobs. They want new opportunities. They want to think about graduate school. And so now, as you can imagine, there are demands for graduate school to develop affirmative action policy. 
there are demands for the private sector to develop some affirmative action policy. And in fact, last year, the Brazilian federal government passed a policy requiring that uh, affirmative action be implemented for the civil service. These good government jobs that traditionally have gone to the white middle class and the upper class. And so I think this is going to continue. It's going to snowball until the privileged sectors of the Brazilian economy, higher education, the government reflect the uh, complexion of the population, so to speak. Because let me get a show of hands. How many people have been to Brazil? Anybody in this class? Well, I encourage all of you to visit. It's a beautiful country. Uh, I've been going for 30 years. I've lived there about four years overall. Uh, and I saw this the first time I was in Brazil, and I saw this when I was in Brazil uh, last year. If you look toward the, um, if you're walking along the street in Brazil, and you look to the um, jobs that are the hardest, are the most um, dirty and least prestigious and most manual labor jobs, that's a dark population. But if you look to the people with suits and ties and briefcases and dress very well, that's a much lighter population. And this struck me decades ago when I first went to Brazil. It was in my face. And uh, one of my first thoughts was, I've seen this movie before. I'm from the United States. I've seen this movie before. This is not new to me. What I'm seeing is not new to me. This social hierarchy overlapping this racial hierarchy. I've seen it. Uh, and so it still exists. Brazil has continues to have major problems with inequality, dramatic uh, social problems and racial problems. And one of the issues that is getting a lot of attention now that we confront here in the United States is um, crime, with Afro-Brazilians tending to be uh, overrepresented among the victims of crime, overrepresented uh, in the prison population, and overrepresented among the victims of police brutality and police killings. And I know there's a Black Lives Matter movement here, and there's a lot of ongoing protests against mass, incarcer course, mass incarcer incarceration and police brutality. And I can only say, unfortunately, the situation is worse in Brazil. The situation is worse for Brazil. Uh, on all the standard indicators. Uh, more police violence against African Brazilians. Um, more uh, tragic prison living conditions for Afro Brazilians. And again, more violence in um, poor communities in Brazil, in which Afro Brazilians tend to be overrepresented. So it's um, despite the excitement that scholars and activists have about affirmative action in Brazil and the potential for change, the reality is still very difficult. And I was mentioning to some of you earlier that uh, that uh, the potential that we have for continued change is being threatened now by some major corruption scandals and by um, uh, a downturn in the economy. The Brazilian economy is growing very rapidly five years ago, ten years ago. Now it's down to one or two percent. So uh, the resources available for some of these new policies is uh, uh, being put at risk. Let me make some comments about the United States. I am very disappointed to report that the United States seems to be making a full retreat from affirmative action and a commitment to racial equality and racial justice in higher education and other fields. It's very disappointing to me. But 
many states have passed legislation, including our great state of Michigan, that makes the use of race, gender, and other relevant characteristics illegal in the hiring process, in the admissions process for higher education. So you've seen uh, the numbers drop uh, in terms of diversity at the University of Michigan, for example, Michigan State University. You've seen it in California, UCLA, you see Berkeley, uh, and other states around the country. And, and so uh, the book that I mentioned by Randall Kennedy on affirmative action is a defense of affirmative action. He supports affirmative action. He argues that he, bene he personally benefited from affirmative action as an undergrad, as a law student, as a distinguished law professor, and he thinks we still need it. But he knows he's fighting uh, a difficult battle in which you have some of the most important political figures uh, coming out against affirmative action now. Even scholars um, who used to support affirmative action coming out against affirmative action, and some are arguing that we don't need racial affirmative action anymore. What we need is socioeconomic affirmative action. And uh, Kennedy believes, as I do, that we don't only need socioeconomic affirmative action, and that if we continue to refuse to use race and ethnicity in our calculation uh, for hiring or accepting classes that the numbers will continue to drop and uh, the spaces will become less diverse and we think that's not good for um, uh, society as a whole. And so overall I would say that Unfortunately, Brazil and the United States can be described as uh, countries uh, where white supremacy is still in effect. In my chapter in this book, I look at the political class in Brazil. I look at the Congress, the executive branch, the president's cabinet, and the Supreme Court and in a country in which 50% of the population is either black or brown, which is the case in Brazil, twenty percent of the Congress is black or brown, three percent of the cabinet is black or brown, there are no black or brown members of the Supreme Court, and very few black or brown members of the federal court in Brazil. And so, again, it's that phenomenon that um, black activists and foreign journalists have pointed out repeatedly throughout Brazil's history that if you go to uh, Congress in Brazil or if you go to a meeting of the government, you think, Wait, am I in Brazil or am I in Sweden? Am I in Brazil or am I in Switzerland? Because it really is a white elite. Uh, even though Brazil is a very racially diverse country in which racial mixing has been celebrated, miscegenation has been celebrated over the years with terms like racial democracy, racial harmony. Uh, but I think the reality is, is very different. And I continue to argue that the United States is a system of white supremacy, even though we have an African American president, because even though I believe it's good to have racial diversity, it's good to have black faces in high places, when the policies don't change, then that is problematic. And so I think Barack Obama has been a tremendous disappointment to many of his supporters and uh, in various areas, failure to stand up to uh, Wall Street and financial greed, uh, willingness to bail out the banks but not fully bail out the people who lost their homes, 
uh, experiencing other difficulties. His late arrival on all these issues, mass incarceration and stuff like that. Um, but the issue that really is um, tormenting me is the idea that the first African American president will go down in history as the drone president, as the, sad, the, the president who is presiding over a global assassination program of people of color, mainly in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Sudan, Somalia. How can this be? How can a president uh, who's read Malcolm X, who's read Martin Luther King, and said that they inspired him, how can he um, tarnish their legacy by policies that are, um, I would argue, illegal and unconstitutional by American law, but definitely by international law and international human rights? But these policies are in full effect, and they're uh, killing people as we speak. And so to me, it's a, it's a very, very dramatic situation, a very sad situation, a situation in which we as Americans should be outraged. And I feel that not enough of us are. And so... Why do I bring this up? Because the United States is spending billions, if not trillions of dollars in foreign and military policy. I need some of that money here in Detroit. We need some of that money here in education, in preschool, K-12, and higher education. And so I believe uh, the government is wasting resources diverting resources to death and destruction, alienating the United States from the rest of the world. Uh, and I don't feel it has to be that way. These don't have to be uh, the policies of our government. And I see parallels between uh, foreign policy and domestic policy. How can President Barack Obama tell the brothers in the hood to interact peaceful, peacefully, to embrace peaceful conflict resolution when he is killing people who he thinks might someday harm the United States. To me it's outrageous, unsustainable, and I hope we uh, have uh, good news, better news in the future. We are in a presidential season, presidential election season, and Bernie Sanders is talking about political revolution and social revolution. And so we need, we need a fundamental change of our foreign and domestic policy, and I hope we'll have it uh, sooner rather than later. I want to end here and get your comments and questions, but I thank you again, Alex, for thank you. Thank having you so me, inviting me. Yeah, I'm just curious as to what the political dynamic is that's allowing uh, Brazil to undergo this move. I mean, given that there's clearly been a dominance of the lighter skin, what's allowing this pol political dynamic where you're seeing over the course of 10, 12 years this, this shift towards embracing uh, affirmative action in higher education? Well, I've studied this question, and my explanation is that a few factors came together, and the combination of those factors uh, empowered leaders to develop new policies. Most important uh, factor was the uh, transition from military dictatorship to civilian democratic rule. Brazil had a military dictatorship from 1964 to 1985. It was a conservative reactionary military dictatorship. 
it uh, killed people, it disappeared people, it imprisoned people, it tortured people, it exiled people. So it limited the range of political options. With the return of democracy and civilian rule in the 1980s, mid-80s, and late 80s, you brought new players to politics. Labor union leaders got more visibility and access. Some of the politicians who were in exile came back and were able to play important roles in uh, state, local, uh, and national government. In addition, uh, you had the black movement in Brazil, which is made up of uh, labor activists, neighborhood activists, student activists, professionals, artists. They had been doing it during the military dictatorship, but after the dictatorship, they continued to argue that their black political agenda had to be incorporated into the agenda, the political agenda of the nation. So if they were uh, religious activists, they argued that the church had to take up this uh, struggle for racial inequality, or racial struggle for racial equality. If they were in political parties, they said we have to struggle for racial justice. If they were in labor unions, uh, they said we, get, we have to include black workers in the struggle. So I, I argue that that combination of uh, new political blood in general, ongoing black political activism, contributed to kind of a new discourse, new party programs, new commitments. And once these new players started getting elected to office, black activists said, now is our time. You need to implement what we talked about. You need to pass these policies. And so that's how it was uh, with affirmative action. One of uh, the most important historic black activists is a guy named Abdis Nascimento. He uh, was born in 1914, died in uh, 2011, so he lived a long life. <laughs> he lived a long life. He was advocating affirmative action slash racial quotas of the type that had been implemented in the last 10 to 15 years in the 1940s. In the 1940s. So it's been a long struggle. It's been a long struggle. He was one of the activists who was forced into exile during the 60s and 70s and 80s. When he came back to Brazil, he was active in a political party, he ran for office, he was elected to Congress, he became a deputy and a senator, and this is in the 80s and 90s, and continued to push for affirmative action. Never got anything passed. But when he left Congress, the Workers' Party, which wasn't his party, but was even a more leftist party, gained power. And some of the black activists in the Workers' Party agreed with Nancy Mento and said, we've got to implement this affirmative action program. And so that happened at the national level, but it happened at the state level, state and local level earlier. And so, uh, that's how I explained it, was the confluence of these various factors. And you're right, the people who were implementing these policies were white politicians, were white elected officials who were aligned with the black activists, the racial justice activists, in their parties, in their labor unions, uh, in their political spheres. And so uh, I still feel that that's an untold story. We, we don't know all of the details. I've been one of the scholars telling the story, but we still need more research uh, to do it. A scholar, a friend of mine, she argues that um, some of these white politicians decided to support affirmative action because it was the right thing to do. And I say, that, that's, there's more to it than they just had an epiphany. That is the right thing to do. And I say they had their black 
colleagues and comrades and friends say, do the right thing, you know, hounding them uh, to do the right thing. Uh, and they, they did do the right thing, but it wasn't only because they came to this conclusion on their own after meditation and ponderation. <laughs> it was part of a political process and part of a political struggle. Uh, but that story is largely still untold. We need, we need more information. And, uh, and uh, so there's a lot of work to be done if Brazil is to achieve the degree of racial equality and racial justice that's leading activists demand of it.